Another topic which appears in a different light is that of probability. It is surprising and surely significant that in spite of prolonged discussion by many men with the highest technical competence, the subject of, con of probability is still controversial. Quantum theory, with its interpretation of psi function of the fundamental Schrodinger equations in terms of probability, has only accentuated the disagreement and emphasized the desirability of reaching some sort of agreement. One of the chief topics of controversy is the reality status of probability in the world of concrete objects and events. In what sense do concrete individual, individual happenings have a probability? The point of view that wants to make an individual throw of a die, for example, have an objective probability is the point of view that wants to consider the throw of the die as an event in and for itself completely divorced from the events that are associated with it and from the operations which give probability meaning. If we consider the whole picture, however, throw the die and the background in which we calculate its probability, we see that there is a subjective element that we cannot get rid of and that probability is a more complicated thing than it first appears. Although the necessity for keeping in mind the whole background is, I believe, especially pressing in the situations presented by probability. I believe that it is also always present to some extent in every situation in which we try to apply mathematics to concrete situations. The difficulties presented by probability are not different in kind from those we encounter in many other places, only they are more obvious and greater. The insight that it may be dangerous to pick a situation to pieces and analyze it into parts is not an insight for which we had to wait for quantum theory, but the vision had already been seen in other fields. Holism is a word that springs to mind in this connection. Now the desirability of a holistic point of view in many situations may be readily conceded. The difficulty is how to achieve it. It seems to me that we are here brought face to face with mutually inconsistent demands and that a completely satisfactory solution is not attainable. For it seems to me that perhaps the first prerequisite to all human thinking is the ability to consider one thing at a time and to isolate the various features of experience from their surroundings. The infant makes progress in adapting itself to its environment only when it is able to recognize objects and events as self-contained things which recur, which may be experienced over and over again in different surroundings. Language itself is composed of words, which are merely symbols for relatively fixed aspects of our experience, taken in isolation and abstracted from their surroundings. On a more sophisticated plane, modern science is built on experiment, which exploits the simplification that results when individual features can be picked up from a complex environment, isolated for study, and individually controlled. Isolation appears essential for thinking, when we push the analysis far enough, we see that isolation is in principle impossible, and that no event ever exactly recurs, and no word ever means exactly the same twice. The situation can be dealt with only approximately and by operating first on one level and then on another. In the last analysis, we are forced to practice an art, not a science. It is often said that quantum theory has shown that the observer is not to be forgotten in any analysis, but that he, the, that he has a role to play of usually unappreciated importance. Now, it does indeed seem to me that there is concealed here a new insight, but I believe it is an insight only suggested by the quantum situation and not precisely indicated. The technical observer of quantum theory is little more than the instrument of measurement. In the reaction of this instrument with the object of measurement is to be found the explanation of many of the paradoxes. I think this suggests something further. Quantum theory deals with the object of knowledge and the instrument of knowledge. These that have taught us must be treated as an indissoluble whole. But beyond this, we have knowledge itself, which quantum theory treats as an end product without attempt at analysis. But what is this knowledge and what are its implications? The question is not new, but has been the concern of philosophers for 2,000 years, who have discussed it under the title of epistemology. To a somewhat skeptical outsider, it does not appear that all the philosophical concern with epistemology has got us very far. 
I think one can at the present time discern the dawning of a new insight that is so devastatingly simple that the implications are not yet even fully grasped. This insight comes from the simple observation that knowledge never occurs except in conjunction with a human nervous system which has itself been subjected to elaborate preconditioning. A number of recent scientific developments are playing together in favoring this insight. Perhaps the most important is the recent development of complicated calculating machinery, which so successfully performs operations previously performable only by human beings as to seriously suggest the question as to whether such machines may properly be said to think. There has been much discussion in the technical literature. There seem to be two main attitudes toward this question. One group sees no reason in principle why human thinking should not be duplicated by a sufficiently complex structure which could be constructed by us in a physical or chemical laboratory, although it is to be recognized that the complexities may be so great that at present they can be reproduced only with the cooperation of a biological living system. The other group, which appears to me to be more obviously swayed by emotional considerations, takes the position that thought is something sui generis and that we will never be able to make a machine that will think. To maintain this position, emphasis is laid on those characteristics of thinking, such as the ability to set its own problems or to think about thinking, which have not yet been incorporated into any computing machine. The discussion continues, and it is not yet clear whether or not some new feature not yet visualizable as attainable in computing machinery will be necessary or not in order to successfully reproduce all that is usually implied in thinking. A number of recently developed lines of inquiry are all converging on giving a better understanding of what is involved in trying to reproduce some of the functioning of the nervous system and the still more general problem of understanding the nature of the nervous system itself. One such line of inquiry is information theory, which is proving to have application far beyond the range of communication engineering for which it was designed, even reaching so far as to throw new light on complex biological problems. Closely related, related to information theory is the subject of servo mechanisms, that is, those mechanisms which automatically alter their functioning in response to changes in their environment. This is the subject for which Norbert Wiener coined the word cybernetics and to which he has made important contributions. On the physiological side, knowledge of the manner of functioning of the brain is accumulating at a rapidly accelerating pace, stimulated by the development of new electrical techniques. This subject is, however, admittedly still in its infancy. It is not known, for example, what in the functioning of the brain corresponds to what we call consciousness. An appreciation is growing of the complexities of the processes back of perception. Of course, the psychologists have realized this for a long time and have been able to demonstrate it by the systematic study of various sorts of illusions. Recently, a new vividness has been given to the realization of the complexity of this situation by the ingenious demonstrations of the late Adelbert Ames, Jr. and his colleagues. The perception of space, which for us is so immediate and compulsive, is seen as something of great complexity, involving both the present structure and the past preconditioning of the nervous system. One cannot see the demonstrations without being impelled to ask whether the mold of space and time into which our perceptions pour the world of our experience is a good mold or not. In view of the facts in the quantum domain of the very small and the new cosmological discoveries on the scale of the very large, including the possibility of the continuous creation of matter, one cannot help feeling that the mold of space and time is not a very good mold for the entire range of phenomena. Whether it is possible to create a better mold is not at present evident. It is at least evident that ingrained habits of thought are going to demand a supremely creative act of imagination if we are ever going to break out of the rut. Brain physiology is giving the insight that the complexity of the brain is so enormous as to provide by a fantastically wide margin for the possibility of all the conscious experiences which a man can have in a lifetime. 
Scientific economy demands, therefore, that in our endeavor to understand the nature of thinking, we exhaust the possibilities and the complexity of our nervous system organization as we now know it, before we introduce any at present unknown or extra natural considerations. There is at present no indication whatever that a complete re reduction to natural factors will not ultimately be possible. While brain physiology is suggesting the adequacy of the nervous structure of the brain to provide for all of our thinking, it is at the same time emphasizing the complete impotence of the brain to reproduce the full complexity of the external world of which it is a part. The reason is simply that the external world is so much bigger than the brain that full correspondence between the state of the brain and the state of the world is utterly impossible. From this point of view, it is little short of a miracle that the brain is able to set up a correspondence with the external world good enough to satisfy the demands of mere survival. Specialized modes of functioning will seem to be demanded which slowly evolved with the evolution of organic life. At the same time, there is no reason to think that such methods of functioning would be adapted to meet the full range of requirements beyond the necessity of survival. One of the specialized modes of function which the brain has evolved and of which we have already spoken is to isolate features out of the whole matrix of experience. Isolation gives us our objects and our words without thinking seems inconceivable. We are nevertheless encountering new realms of experience in which we can see that this ubiquitous device may no longer be adequate. It did not need the recent developments of brain physiology to emphasize the complexity of the nervous processes of the brain. One of the most important of the insights of Freud was the realization that processes are going on in the brain of which we are usually completely unaware, but which may nevertheless, on occasion, play a dominating role, even at the level of conscious activity. From this point of view, it has always seemed to me that philosophers like Hume and Mach who have insisted on the reducibility of all experience to sense impressions have grossly oversimplified. Even under the thesis that only natural factors are involved in the behavior of organisms, surely no one would undertake to reproduce the behavior of man or of any other organism, no matter how simple, given only the complete history of all the stimulus which it had received through its sense organs. In addition, the complete biological inheritance would be required, which determines, among other things, whether the egg turns into a man or an amoeba, and which can by no means be described in terms of stimuli to the organism from outside, whether conscious or not. There is a recent development in mathematics which emphasizes the difficulty of adequately understanding the nature of knowledge. In much of the discussion of whether a machine could be constructed which might properly be said to think, particular emphasis is usually laid on the difficulty of making a machine that will do such things as reconstruct itself, as do biological systems, or learn in the sense of being able to modify its own built-in codes of action. Now these are special cases of the machine dealing with itself. These particular special problems can probably be solved to at least some degree of approximation. The point I want to make here is that whenever a system is required to deal with itself, it is felt that special difficulties are involved which will demand special methods of solution. A recent development in mathematical logic is suggestive in this connection by analogy. I don't claim there's a precise proof of the connection is precise. Gödel was able to show that a logical system of the complexity of arithmetic can never be proven to be free from concealed self-contradiction so long as one is restricted to theorems provable only within the system of arithmetic. This discovery was perhaps as shocking to the preconceived notions of many mathematicians as was relativity theory or quantum theory to the physicist. The conceptual implications for the mathematician are still being discussed. For us, we concentrate on one simple aspect of this situation, namely that here we have a system, arithmetic, dealing with itself and encountering limitations which had not been suspected until they were brought to light by detailed analysis. 
It does not need much effort of the imagination to see here something of more general import and to expect that whenever we find a system dealing with itself, we may find special and perhaps even insurmountable limitations. The application to our present problem is immediate. For when we try to understand the nature of knowledge, we have a nervous system attempting to deal with an aspect of its own functioning. That is, we have a system dealing with itself. Expressed differently, we as individuals and the human race as a race cannot get away from ourselves in spite of our fond imagining that we can and in spite of the fact that the structure of much of our thought ignores recognition of our inability to do so. The presumption that there must be unsuspected inherent limitations because of this appears to me to be almost irresistible. The broad outcome of these considerations stemming from brain physiology, cybernetics, information theory, and indeed also stemming from the more particular insights of physical science afforded by relativity theory and quantum theory, may be simply formulated in the statement that we do not yet understand the nature of our thinking or of our intellectual tools. It seems to me that the one overwhelmingly important intellectual problem before us all is to acquire more adequate knowledge of the nature of thinking. Who can doubt that when we have acquired it, the complex problems of daily life, to which unreflective familiarity has lent such a deceptively simple appearance, will appear in a light sufficiently illuminating so that we may hope to get some degree of rationality into our handling of them. In the meantime, on a less grandiose scale, I think that science gives insights into the non-scientific situations of the humanities and daily life sufficient to justify us in attempting to make a more rational attack on some of these problems without waiting for a complete final solution. Consider, for example, a field which it is usually said science is unable to enter, the field of values. It must be admitted that simple observation of any of the simple special sciences shows that science has no method of determining what we should do in various situations. Its function is descriptive, explanatory, and predictive. Although science has to accept values as given as the preset conditions of a problem to which it addresses itself, science can legitimately strive for more precise description of that human behavior which concerns itself with values, and in so doing may uncover aspects of the situation not previously fully appreciated. Or science can set itself the problem of explaining how it came about that particular sorts of behavior are accepted as having value. Finally, science can set itself the problem of predicting with more assurance than would casually be possible what will be the consequences to society and the individual of acting in accordance with any particular set of values. Now, all these scientific activities carry the potentiality for most important reactions back on the system of values itself. For the value which a man ascribes to a particular line of conduct can hardly help being affected if he sees it in an unfavorable historical perspective or if he realizes that consistent action by other people according to that value would result in social effects which he had not anticipated and which he does not desire. In fact, it seems to me that we have here the ultimate and the only rational tool by which we may hope to purify our values. It does no real good to moralize or to tell a man what is his duty. If a man responds to the appeal to do his duty, it is only because of the veiled threat of social coercion. He who consents against his will is of the same opinion still. But a man will change his values when he sees that there are consequences which he had not realized. The task of the individual in forming his value system is to acquire the greatest possible self-consciousness of all the consequences implicit in, his, in that value system. Society, in educating the values of the individual, can rightly do no more than to devise methods for making the individual fully aware of all the consequences of acting according to this or that code of value. Further, a task of society is to devise such a method of mutual living that the individuals may realize their own values with a minimum amount of mutual interference. 
It will doubtless happen that the self-consciously educated values of some individuals will be so inconsistent with the values of the median that the only possible way of dealing with such individuals is by forcible repression, something which is practical provided there are only a few such individuals. It is to the advantage of society that every individual acquire the greatest possible degree of self-consciousness of the consequences of his own value system, because in this way there is the greatest stability against the possibility of unprepared for a change. The great gamble to which society is committed is that the average human being is so constituted that his value system will be compatible with the harmonious living together of all. If this is not true, we had better find it out as soon as possible and in the light of it revise our whole social philosophy. In this reassessing of values, both from the point of view of the individual and society, the insights which we are acquiring from our scientific experience may well play a determinative role. In conclusion and summary, the scientific enterprise is not different in kind from any other human enterprise in which the method of intelligence is competent to play a leading role. The situations with which, which are the immediate concern of science are, however, a much greater simplicity than the situations of daily life. Because of this greater simplicity, science has been the first to, inquire, to acquire the new insights which are demanded to cope with the ever-growing complexity of our environment. These same insights are applicable in the much wider setting afforded by society. When, by the application of these insights, we have become masters of our intellectual tools and understand the nature and the limitations of thinking, you may expect to surmount the frustrations which now so often beset us. The way is long and difficult, however, and will demand a radical break with traditional habits of thought. If you have some questions for Dr. Bridgman, I suggest that you come up after the uh, meeting and talk with him. This, con this concludes the second John Franklin Carlson lecture. Thank you again, Dr. Bridgman.